I've entitled the message today, Beloved, Earnestly Contend for the Faith. They did all this hoping to get relief is really what they were looking for. Do you know why most people who claim the name of Christ today do the little bit of Christianity that they do? Because they hope to get relief. They're hoping to not go to hell. I think this is so important. And I got to tell you, I myself, from what I see here, and by studying for this passage, I myself have had the wrong opinion about what we're going to talk about here in a minute. And the Lord had to correct me. To begin in verse number one of the epistle of Jude. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ, the brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. Mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and to exhort, and exhort you <clears throat> that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. Ungodly men, turning the grace of God of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Likewise also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignities. Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. But these speak evil of those things which they know not, but what they know naturally is brute beast. In those things they corrupt themselves. Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain, and ran greedily after the heir of Balaam for reward, and perished in the gainsaying of Kor. These are spots in your feast of charity, when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withereth, without fruit, twice plucked, dead, twice, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. Raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame. Wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. And Enoch also the seventh from Adam prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousand of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among all, among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have ungodly committed. And of all their hard speeches, which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lust, and their mouth speak great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. But beloved, remember ye the words which are spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. These be they who separate themselves, sensual, having not the spirit. But ye, beloved, build up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life, and of some having compassion, making a difference. And others say with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. But it says here that he prophesied of these saying. He gave a prophecy way back then. He is the seventh generation of men on the earth. And he had a testimony there with God. He prophesied that in the latter days there would be, at the time of the Lord's return, there would be these false teachers. But I tell you what, that's pretty amazing. If you remember back in Jude verse 4, it says, For there are certain men crept in unawares, 
who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. I told you that means that literally it was prophesied before that these men would come. We saw the fact Jesus prophesied about it. Paul prophesied about it. Peter had prophesied about it. Jude tells us about it. And guess what? All the way back in Genesis, the guy who lived in told the world, think about this. Even before the time of Noah, before there was a children of Israel, and he told us, there's coming a time when the Lord's going to return with his saints to take vengeance on those people who are ungodly. Here's what he said. Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. Isn't that interesting? Thousands is plural. Listen, the simple fact is few there be that find it. Real true Christians are small compared to what the world thinks there are. The world calls everybody a Christian. If you're Catholic, if you're Messes, if you're Jewish, they call everybody a Christian. It doesn't matter what you are. As long as you say God or Jesus, you must be a Christian. No, that's not what the Bible says. In fact, there's an awful lot of people chasing after a long-haired hippie Jesus who ain't the Jesus of the Bible. Some of you may be, what? Jesus didn't have long hair? Nope. I can prove it by the Bible. Amen. He had short hair and a long beard because he would have been observant to the law, which required a long beard. Remember that uh, writers of the Bible could not write what they wanted to write. Look in 2 John, verse number 12. Look at what John says. Having many things to write unto you, I would not write with paper and ink. But I trust to come unto you and speak face to face. And join me. John says, look, I've got a lot more stuff to write, but I can't write it with paper and ink. God didn't allow him. Look at 3 John. Verse number 13, I had many things to write, but I will not with ink and pen write unto thee. You see, the writers of the Bible could not write what they wanted to write. Because holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Drew wrote what God wanted him to write. And what God wanted written. And it was needful or necessary. Look, he says again, beloved, when I gave all diligence to write into the common salvation, he says, when I wanted to carefully write to you about the common salvation, he says, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered for the saints. He says, I wanted to write about this common salvation, about the salvation that we all share. He says, but there was something else more needful. It was needful that I exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. It was needful for necessary thing that Jude decided to write on, or rather that God inspired Jude to write about. And I'm going to tell you what, it was a needed message, and it's a needed message today. But I'll tell you what, it would do every preacher well to preach on the book of Jude repeatedly for a while. To tell the people that they need to earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. First Peter chapter 4 and verse 1. Down to verse number 5. For as much as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. That he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles. When we walked in lasciviousness, lust, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries, wherein they think it strange that ye run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you, who shall give account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead. You know what lasciviousness is? It's what we walked in before salvation. And once you get this, these men are lost. And they turn the grace of God into a means of feeding their flesh. It's not real grace. It's a greasy grace that's preached by men who say that you can be saved without repentance and apart from a changed life. These are men who say you can be saved and have no fruit. When God says you'll know them by their fruit. These are the men who preach just believe and receive, but don't re preach repentance towards God and the faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. These are men who teach that you can receive Jesus without him being Lord. 
These men are the creeps who have crept in unaware. These men who say you can live like the world, live in the world, act like the world, think like the world, dress like the world, hang out with the world, and yet you can still be saved. Well, right here, when it talks about of the common salvation, it's the salvation that every person who has ever believed and ever has been saved or will be saved has in common. This common salvation is shared by all who've been saved and will be saved. My proposition for today is this, that every, let me say it again, every believer must be earnestly contending for the faith. Let me say it one more time. Every believer must be earnestly contending for the faith. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. There's a lot of people out there that appear to be good. They appear to be preachers of righteousness. They appear to be people like Mr. Graham. Amen. And his son Franklin. They appear good, but guess what you find out? They start telling you there's more than one way to heaven. They're not good. In fact, they're exactly what the Bible talks about here in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 13. But such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. The Bible says, listen, don't be surprised. Satan likes to appear as an angel of light. He likes to appear as something good. In fact, most of the false religions and all the New Age people talk about what? The light, the light, the light. Well, the light they're getting is coming from the light bearer, Satan. But it's not good. And there's an awful lot of preachers out there who seem to be good. But they're nothing more than ministers of Satan. He says, earnestly contend for the faith. I pray that you get the, the implications here. That here in the very first century, somewhere between 40 and 60 years after Christ's ascension into heaven, it was already necessary for Christians to start earnestly contending for the faith. Now let me ask you something. If the Bible tells you that evil men and seducers will wax worse and worse and things will get worse, do you think it was more needful then for this message or now? I think it was just as needful then, if not more needful now. Because things have indeed waxed worse. Less than 60 years after Christ's death, burial, resurrection, the faith that was once delivered to the saints was already under attack. I want you to understand something. Everyone who is disobedient to God, and especially all those who teach error, are going to spend an eternity in darkness. You're not going to be able to see your friends. This idea that you can go to hell and have a party with your friends is wrong, according to the Word of God. In fact, the Bible says, where the worm dieth not, there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You'll be begging for one drop of water to cool your tongue. I want you to understand that some of these men who have crept in are actually in leadership positions amongst Christians. Every believer must remember that God's wrath will fall on those who preach error. I want you to understand something. That's going to be the, he's going to judge the quick and the dead. He's going to judge those who are Christians based on how they've lived their life for the Lord. He's going to base, judge those who aren't Christians as to whether or not they've accepted Christ as our Savior. Now, here's an interesting thing. Look at me in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Those of us that are saved, once we're judged and he declares us righteous because of the blood of Christ, 1 Corinthians chapter 6 tells us something. Verse 2, do ye not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? Now, isn't that funny? All these people who claim to be Christians are running around telling you what? Judge not. Judge not. Who are you to judge? God's the only one to judge. Well, God just told me in the Bible I'm going to judge. 
maybe you don't believe the Bible, but I do. In fact, I know I'm commanded in the Bible to judge righteous judgment. That means I look at your life, and I look at the Word of God, and I go, you ain't living it. That's proper and right. By the way, it says, judge not that you be not judged. You know why I can judge? Because I will be judged. Amen. Anybody that will be judged can judge. And the same standard I judge with the Word of God is how I want to be judged. And by the way, you judge me by the Word of God. And if you find me wanting, you tell me, and I'll fix myself. Amen. And all of a sudden, he started teaching some strange things that he never taught before. And by the way, you judge me by the word of God. And if you find me wanting, you tell me, and I'll fix myself. I'll fix myself. I'll fix myself. Hey, thanks for watching this video, y'all. Um, this is a really sad video. This is the hardest one I've ever had to make. Um, in this video, we're going to be talking about Mr. Butch Lawrence Crawford. The reason for this video is because I've recommended him to you all, and he's done exactly why I didn't really want to recommend any other teachers. Uh, he's he's fallen away from the faith I've seen in the last week. Um, I know this is a pretty harsh accusation. Um, please give me some time to explain this matter. As much respect as I can give a person, that's what I've put into this. Because I've, I've watched this man for years. We used to talk until we had a falling out. Um, I guess over Jason Cooley probably because his, uh, his false teaching about angels raping uh, women to come up with giant's folly. But um, Butch didn't like it when I told him on the phone that um, I thought that was a heresy and that Cooley was a snake that doesn't really believe the King James Bible. And now I'm going to have to mark Butch right along with him like he told me to do when I talked to him on the phone a couple of years back, like maybe four or five years ago. Um, I, I just put my personal differences aside and because uh, he did have some good strong teachings, uh, but... Sadly, I, I, I would strongly suggest you not listen to that man for nothing. Um, let me go ahead and uh, get started with that. I'll, I'll chime back in here in 15, 20 minutes. He's mostly going to preach against himself. I'm using clips from his previous videos where I feel like he was strong in the faith. And then here you go. I think this is so important. And I got to tell you, I myself, from what I see here and by studying for this passage, I myself have had the wrong opinion about what we're going to talk about here in a minute. And the Lord had to correct me. Colossians chapter number 3. Look what Paul says in verse number 8 of Colossians chapter number 3. Speaking to the believers at Colossae, he says, But now ye also put off all these anger, wrath, Malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds. Paul says, hey, you're a Christian. People of Colossae, you put off the old man. So stop doing those things. I want you Christians to stop blaspheming. Now many people would say, that if a person was compelled to blaspheme, well, if they could deny Christ, what's the next thing they'll say? They were never what? Saved. They weren't really a Christian if under torture they denied Christ. Well, let me ask you a question. We just saw blasphemies in that list in Colossians 3.8. Would we say a person was never saved if they get angry? Would we say they're never saved if they sometimes have wrath? If sometimes they're guilty of malice, if they're sometimes guilty of filthy communication, blah, 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 because they had just hit my thumb. Oh, oh, oh. Well, guess what? <laughs> they had filthy communication come out of their mouth when they hit their thumb with that hammer. They must not be a Christian. Never were. Couldn't have been. Well, that's not what the word of God says. Stop perverting the word of God. So, out of this whole sermon that Butch had about uh, liking and blasphemy unto the Lord, um, to denying the Lord, he never actually included uh, the one time in the Bible that we show somebody actually denying the Lord.
and that was saved too. So turn with me please to Luke chapter 22 and verse 31. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren that thy faith fail not, and when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. And he said unto him, Lord, I am ready to go with thee both into prison and to death. And he said, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day, before that thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. So look back again at verse 32. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not, and when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. And when thou art converted, um, that means born again. It doesn't mean to repent or come back. It means to be born again, to be saved, to be converted and changed into a new creature, which is to be saved. Strengthen thy brethren. So he told him, so once you get born again, then strengthen the brethren. And that's why he ca he wrote what he did in Second Peter chapter two about people like Butch and Steve Anderson and H Jack Hiles, uh teaching damnable heresy, uh, even denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. And they'll give you any kind of an excuse to get you to ignore the Scripture and to believe on their word, which is a lie. It's their idle shepherds that can't save anything. You got mad. You were never saved. Think about it. By the way, I'm, I'm in a room, and every person in this room, if, if you lost your salvation for anger, ain't nobody in this room be saved. <clears throat> Am I lying? You see, I want you to understand something. According to Matthew chapter 12 and verse number 36, now this is a hard standard. And listen, I'm guilty. We're all guilty. But listen to Matthew 12, 36. Listen carefully to what the Word of God says. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. Let me read that again. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. God says, even those words you said, flip it like, just joking around. Those idle words, it didn't have really mean anything. You're going to give an account even of them. You better watch what you say, amen? No. They're all shaking their head no because they know it's the truth. How about lying? How about lying? By the way, if anybody said, not me, I never get angry. Well, guess what? You just lost yourself. You were never saved, right? I mean, seriously, I want us to be biblical about this. You see, we've always been taught, especially amongst fundamentalism and, and people who take this book seriously, if they ever deny Christ, they were never truly saved. But Paul says they were saints. These are the men who preach, just believe and receive, but don't re preach repentance towards God and the faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Am I lying? These are men who teach that you can receive Jesus without him being Lord. These men are the creeps who have crept in unaware. These men who say you can live like the world, live in the world, act like the world, think like the world, dress like the world, hang out with the world, and yet you can still be saved. They turn what true biblical grace is into a means to live as the flesh desires and wants. Because if we live what we believe and believe that they're saints, and we know people can smack their thumb and deny Christ with their words. There's too much loosey-goosey, fast, run-of-the-mill, you know, get you to say a one, two, three, repeat after me prayer in this world. And there's people who are twofold children of hell because they believe that prayer that they said as a get-out-of-jail-free ticket, a get-out-of-hell-free ticket, is actually going to do something for them. They don't live like the things of God. They don't care about the things of God. They live however they want, but they have a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof. Oh, I love Jesus. Uh, weren't you just out at the bar last night drinking and smoking and sleeping around doing all kinds of... Yeah, but I love Jesus. 
Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Oh, why you got to judge? You know what I'm talking about? We really don't think under persecution a Christian could say, no, 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 you're right, because they want the pain to stop. Of course they can. Why? We got a problem. It's right here. You know what it's called? Flesh. Because the real Bible grace that brings salvation is devoid of lasciviousness. You're not going to find true biblical grace having the desire to want to feed the flesh. They've turned the grace of God into lasciviousness. It says, and deny the only Lord God. I pray that you get this. In reality, these, these men have crept in, deny the only Lord God. Why? We got a problem. It's right here. You know what it's called? Flesh. And by the way, he is the only Lord God. There is no other God. Look at John 17, verse 3. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. And by the way, this is exactly what Peter told us would happen in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them. And we know people can smack their thumb and deny Christ with their words just because of the pain from that. We really don't think under persecution a Christian could say, no, 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 you're right, because they want the pain to stop. Of course they can. Why? We got a problem. It's right here. You know what it's called? Flesh. They turn what true biblical grace is into a means to live as the flesh desires and wants. By the way, just pinch it. You'll see it hurts. Pinch it hard enough, you might go, ow! Right? And that's nothing compared to what Paul put some of them through to make them say, he's not Messiah. He didn't rise from the dead. And bring upon themselves swift destruction. They not only deny that God is the only God, they also deny that only through him and his son is salvation available to men. They deny the only Lord God when they pervert the word of God. We're told in Titus how this happens. Titus chapter 1. And verse number 5 and 6. I know I'm going quick now, but I want to finish this. The Bible says, For this cause, left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order things that are wanting, and, order, and ordain elders in every city, as I have appointed. I'm sorry, verse 15 and 16. <laughs> Unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. When they are disobedient to the word of God, they are denying God. When they are living abominable lives, and the Bible calls homosexual, homosexuality abominable, just because of the pain from that. We really don't think under persecution a Christian could say, no, 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 you're right, because they want the pain to stop. There's giants in the land, therefore we're like grasshoppers in their sight. We can't take the land. Uh, the same God just parted the sea, made dry land, walked to a cross, did all those plagues to Egypt, killed all the firstborn of every person and every animal, and you're worried? Really? They're murmurers. Of course they can. Why? We got a problem. It's right here. You know what it's called? Flesh. By the way, just pinch it. You'll see it hurts. Pinch it hard enough, you might go, ow! Right? Second Peter 2.18 For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they are lower through the lust of the flesh, through much wantonness. Those who were clean escape from them who live in error. And that's nothing compared to what Paul put some of them through to make them say, he's not Messiah. He didn't rise from the dead. So he says that Paul do what? I'm not even going to repeat that. 
but I'll make him repeat it. Here you go. Compared to what Paul put some of them through to make them say, he's not Messiah. He didn't rise from the dead. So where did Paul say that at? That horrible, wicked lie against the Bible. Um, Acts chapter 26, and let's start in verse number 9. I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth, which thing I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests, and when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. And I punished them oft in every synagogue, and compelled them to blaspheme, and, ex and being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even unto strange cities. It does say here, and compelled them to blaspheme. And blaspheme means to speak against. It does not mean to repent of the faith, or recant of the faith, or reject the faith, or deny the faith, or Jesus, however you choose to word this. It just says that, they, that he compelled them to blaspheme. It doesn't even necessarily mean that they did as he was trying to compel them even. He'll uh, make a big deal out of this right here um, to make it sound like Paul made a bunch of Christians reject Jesus Christ. Well, that's a straight up law and more of adding to God's word. Um, that's what's so bad about commentaries and all this though is there's so much word of man and so little word of Bible and I mean I know I'm sitting here talking to you using a lot of my own words too. I get that and I, if you catch me adding or removing from the word of God by all means comments are right there please let me know but but you actually like post the book chapter and verse or something like that let me know where i messed up i'm not perfect and i sure don't think that my attitude and behavior is any better than than mr crawford's is but you have to make a decision i mean what's your sole authority the bible or is the Bible secondary or maybe complementary or does the Bible need more, you know, you don't think the Bible is sufficient and it needs more documents from men or something to, so you can understand it better or something like that. That's, I don't really get it, okay? Like, if you study the Bible like you should as a Christian, but I do believe in the promise in the Bible that I don't have a need of man to teach me anything, but that the spirit of truth would teach me all things. Alright, so on a little side note here, um, let's see what happened uh, the first time somebody added to the Word of God. You ready to learn something? I've, a lot of people I've met didn't realize this. Uh, I don't know you, so maybe you do. <laughs> so, Genesis chapter 2. So we're going to read about what happened in the Garden of Eden. Um, first, let's uh, read here about what uh, the Lord said in verse 16. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of, no of, but of, the, tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. So... Just keep in mind what the Lord said there in verse number 17. So, let's go on down into chapter 3 and verse number 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not... You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. <laughs> and actually, while I was looking at this, um, I'm seeing something that I didn't see before. Eve actually removed from the word of God. Eve actually removed from the word of God as well. She just said the tree which is in the midst of the garden.
because the Lord actually said, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and, good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day thou, that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. All right, so on a little side note here, um, let's see what happened uh, the first time somebody added to the Word of God. You ready to learn something? I, a lot of people I've met didn't realize this. Uh, I don't know you, so maybe you do. <laughs> so Genesis chapter 2. So we're going to read about what happened in the Garden of Eden. Um, first, let's uh, read here about what uh, the Lord said in verse 16. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou may, mayest eat, mayest freely eat, but of the tree of, of, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. So, what, just keep in mind what the Lord said there, in verse number seventeen. So, let's go on down into chapter 3 and verse number 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Catch that? Never said not to. Added to the word. And I'm sure most of you watching this happens next. Shoot. Cons are this straight up. Let's go to Genesis chapter 2 and verse 9. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden. What was it that was said that was in the midst of the garden? The tree of life. And the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Um, I've never really thought about it like this before, but you know that she answered Satan. When she was answering Satan, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden. What was in the midst of the garden? It says the tree of the tree of life. God hath said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest ye die. Um, I just actually learned something right here on camera in front of everybody. Um, that's that doesn't happen nearly enough. Um, thought I understood this already, only partly. It's just awesome to uh, get more understanding as I'm doing study and just to help other people out here. And that's why I do this. This is what keeps me on my toes with Bible study. Um, people think that it's wrong to out a false teacher or unkind or unchristian, but the thing of it is, if you really think that, you haven't studied your Bible. Romans chapter 16, verse 17, we're supposed to mark and avoid these people that teach contrary to the doctrine we've learned and avoid them. I mean, come on. I'm, I'm helping you out. I mean, if, if there was somebody that was going to come and hurt you, wouldn't you want somebody to warn you? Well, of course you would. You'd say a person is awful if they wouldn't uh, warn you from that. Well, look, I'm telling you about people that's begging you to go to hell with them. You want to go burn an everlasting torment with uh, the rich man and uh, be begging for uh, just a drop of water to cool your tongue in the eternal flame? Don't be angry with me because I want you saved. I don't want you deceived. I want to be your real friend. I love you. I don't know who you are that I'm talking to, but I love all people as a whole. 
I don't need to know you to care about you. I pray for the whole world and the lost and the deceived, the people that are just considering uh, the whole uh, Bible issue and all that. Look, worst of my enemies I'm forced to pray for. <laughs> so I don't reckon any of you guys are, right? These men talked about here, for there are certain men crept in unawares. I want you to see something. Take your Bibles, turn to Matthew 13. They are the tares among the wheat. Matthew 13, verse 25. But while men slept, his enemies came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. God's designed his churches to be perfect. And you know what Satan does? He sends in his ministers of darkness as angels of light. I want you to understand something about these men that came in by stealth. They came in because the watchmen were asleep. And because the servants of the householder had not prepared themselves to recognize them. Because according to Matthew chapter 13, the true servants of the householder will recognize the tares for what they are and will want to weed them out immediately. Look again in Matthew 13, verse 26. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? He saith unto them, an enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? I want you to understand, these men were wide awake. As soon as the tares sprang up, they knew immediately these are not weak. There's something wrong with them. They went to the master and said, Hey, master, can we tear these things up and get them out of the field? Now, all these crazy commentators will tell you, well, the tares are a type of fake wheat that grows in the Middle East called Darnell, and you can't tell the difference. Well, that's not what the Word of God says. Stop perverting the Word of God. Does it or does it not say that as soon as it sprung up, the, house, the servants of the householder could tell? And immediately they went to the householder and said, hey, can we pull these tares up? But yet all these preachers, all these commentators will explain away the word of God, how tares are Darnell and they look just like wheat. You can't tell the truth until blah, 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 blah. Listen, if you ever hear them say that the tares look just like the wheat and you can't hear the difference, all you should hear after that is mm, 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 mm. just shut your ears off and don't listen anymore. Because obviously they haven't actually read the text. And if they have, they've got a problem if they can't understand the plain, simple text as it's written. You see, people who are saved, when they've always read commentaries like that, they've looked at the Word of God and said, that doesn't make any sense. That's not what it says. It's all Paul's mistreatment of the saints, even compelling some to blaspheme. And with that, we talked of how we should view those who did. You see, we've always been taught especially amongst fundamentalism and, and people who take this book serious. If they ever deny Christ, they were never truly saved. But Paul says they were saints. But these guys read it, then they read their commentary and go, oh, that makes perfect sense. You know why? Don't get mad at me. But the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, neither can know them because they're spiritually discerned. I'm going to tell you why a whole lot of preachers will preach that message because they're lost and on the way to hell. They can't see the difference. Either that or they're not really studying. They're not really preachers. They're thieves who have crawled up some other way. These men have crept in and have done so unawares. In the Greek, the word crept in unawares is all one word, and it means to come alongside of and to set down. Some of you have probably heard a preacher somewhere in the past tell you the name for the comforter is paraclete. The one who comes alongside. Well, this word begins with that same word, para. These false teachers, these men who have crept in, they have literally come in alongside the true people and sat right down with them. 
They've come alongside of us and made themselves at home. And we've been so asleep that we haven't been aware of them and their dastardly intentions. I want you to get that. They have entered right in to the solemn assembly of the saints. And the saints were so weak and pathetic that they didn't even notice it. I'm going to tell you what. Or sometimes it happens and the saints notice it. And you know what they do? They go to the pastor or the leader and go, hey, there is a problem here. There's a problem with this woman you chose to be the leader of the women's shelter. And you know what the leaders say? Mind your own business. They've come alongside of us. They've sat down. And we didn't even get scared. We didn't even get bothered. We just let them sit down. We didn't even recognize them from what they were. You know why? Because we haven't been in training. Let me ask you something. Where do you get your training? From the Word of God. The Word of God. You know what it says. You'll see the truth. You know, when you know what the Word of God says, when you hear contemplative mysticism come along, you go, I know what that is. When you hear the word faith men booming come along, you go, I know what that is. And it's contrary to this. Goes on to say, for there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. Now here's where some men get messed up and say that God foreordained these people to come in and foreordained them to die and go to hell. But that's not what the word means here. That's why you got to study to show yourself approved. The meaning here is that these men who had crept in unawares had been previously written about. The warning about these men creeping in had already been sounded out, and the people should have been on guard. Look at Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. This is Jesus. Verse 15, beware of the false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly. They are ravening wolves. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse number 1. Jesus gave us warning. Paul gives us warning here. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, which God has created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. Jesus sounded the warning. Paul sounded the warning. Look at 2 Peter 2.1. 2 Peter 2.1. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them. Paul says he was able to get saints, people who have put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, through pressure and persecution and torture. He was able to compel them or force them to blaspheme. But yet we've had this idea. True believers would never do that. Listen, I'll tell you what, in studying some of our forefathers in the faith. I mean, what forefathers is he studying? This is what gets me. He he doesn't mention what his source is. He just says, I've just been talking to a little birdie or something or another. One commentator said we do it in two ways. And I copied him here because I like what he said. He's... One commentator put it this way. They... But yet all these preachers, all these commentators will explain away the word of God. How anytime you have a man-made system and you must fit the Bible into it, it's never going to work. Um, is his forefathers, not mine, because my forefathers wouldn't teach a person to deny the Lord. They were saved. <laughs> um, you know, if you can't out with names, it's... That's just a claim then. I mean, what forefathers? You need to... You need to substantiate the claim that they were ever Christians. Why are you afraid to name them, Butch? Are you afraid that um, a lot of us will out them for being a Catholic heretic or something? 
um, not quoting your sources is a really bad idea. I mean, because it, it just looks like you're talking to yourself or consulting with a familiar spirit and just named it your church forefathers. Do you know what I found? That during the Middle Ages, we had many Christians who, when they were really going through it, when they were being tortured by the Catholic Church, they recanted, as the Catholic Church calls it. You're right, you're right, you're right, you're right. Definitely not right at all. Um, so, who are these Christians you're talking about that uh, recanted to the Catholic cult? Listen, I'll tell you what, in studying some of our forefathers in the faith, do you know what I found? Well, it's what we've always done. What who's always done? Listen, I'll tell you what, in studying some of our forefathers in the faith, they were previously written about and the fact of their heading to the lake of fire for eternity had already been explained in the word of God. Look at the next thing it says there, though. Ungodly men. These men who are corrupt and unawares and bringing about all this change, changing what the church has always been about, changing the gospel, perverting the gospel, the Bible says they are ungodly. Godly men. They aren't un they aren't saved men who just have a few things wrong. They are men who have not the Lord Jesus Christ and they have not the Father. They're hellbound sinners. We often make excuses for those who have crept in unawares that they just, well, they're a pretty good guy. He preaches a lot of good stuff. I know he's got a couple things wrong, but the truth is they're unsaved men. They're ungodly men. And by the way, you can't be ungodly and saved. <laughs> Amen? I mean, it's pretty simple. You can't be ungodly, not of God, and still be saved. By the way, the Bible declares what's waiting for these people. We already saw it in Jude 1, 15, and then 1 Peter 4, 8, 2 Peter 2, 5, and 6, 2 Peter 3, 7. They all tell you the same thing. These men have an eternity in hell waiting for them you see we need to be on guard against these men we also saw the need to have a real life not just living as we please because we have hope but truly living the way we should but yet Carroll County Maryland is still as wicked as it ever was how did all those people get saved and Carroll County didn't change because they didn't get saved we often hear these stories that preachers have tell, and by the way, I've been guilty. I've told the same story. Shame on me. I didn't test the spirit and try the spirit and go look up the story first. But I've told the story how. And listen, it's it's not condescending or anything like that or being stubborn, but in First John chapter 2, verse 27, But the anointing which you have received of him abideth in you, and you need not that any man teach you. But as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. Now let's look over here. In John chapter 14, verse 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Jesus said. So who's the real teacher here? Commentary books or Holy Ghost? I'm going to take the Holy Ghost instead of a copyrighted book that men sell to make money on. You know what? I mean, there we go. Good old Bible. That's always worked for how many people you reckon been saved with it now since 1611? Um, you, you know, I believe it's perfect and pure and preserved, the very Word of God. I don't think you can improve on it. And you, all I can say is if you really believe that, don't add or don't remove from it. You know, just stick with the pure word of God. And I, I really am. It, it, it's really frustrating in life, all these people that claim that they believe the King James Bible is the word of God. And most of them are flat out liars. You got Schofieldites, Ruckmanites, and um, 
Matthew Henryites and people that like following Calvin and oh my good Spurgeon, you know, how many other goofballs? Um, but the other thing is about these 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 books of men that existed, you know, a hundred plus years ago. Um, how do you even know that's their real testimony? And that's the other thing. Mr. Crawford is deriving his doctrine from some founding fathers, but he's not mentioning names on this. He doesn't not, he doesn't like mentioning his sources. I know that you're going to say to me, "We well, think you can re, re saved?" No. I don't think anybody can get resaved, be straight with you. Um, it's a one-time deal, or it won't happen at all. Um, the only hope I can see from Scripture, and I'll continue, we'll continue into this in the video, but the only hope I can see from Mr. Crawford is, is that he actually was never born again and just needs born again. Because if he really was saved, he's damned. I mean, he's gone. And I know a lot of you once saved just want to turn me off, but listen, the Bible don't teach once saved, always saved. It doesn't. It teaches by grace through faith for salvation. And these and this faith will produce works by the grace of God. But these works don't save or earn or merit any salvation. They prove what you're rooted in, what you love. If you love Jesus, you won't you won't deny him. In the time of trial and all that, he'll give you faith to defeat that. Who are you supposed to be afraid of, man or the Lord? I mean, who did Jesus say to fear? Uh, he who can kill the body or he can kill the body and the soul? I mean, I can go on a long time about this. We got a lot of video to cover, though. Let's roll. Because if we live what we believe and believe that they're saints... And we know people can smack their thumb and deny Christ with their words just because of the pain from that. We really don't think under persecution a Christian could say, no, 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 you're right, because they want the pain to stop. Well, the simple fact, if you say things that are contrary to the word of God, I can't defend you. I don't care who you are. So let me ask you a question. Do you believe that saints stay saints? What do you believe they can lose their salvation? Well, I've learned to answer that question with this. Um, do you actually believe what the entire Bible says? Do you believe what Revelation chapter 22 and verse 19 says? And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, so if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, it's pretty clear cut English so far. Yea, hath God said? Yes, God did say. And it's in the book. Read it. Show them what God says about modesty. You know what God said? Yea, hath God said? Yeah. Cat I stole a long flowing garment. Argue with God. He said it, not me. God shall take away his part out of the book of life. And out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. Do you believe what the Bible says? God shall what? Take away his part out of the book of life. Well, if your part's taken out of the book of life, what does that mean? I mean, doesn't all the saved people have their name in the book of life? That's what I believe is the answer to that question right there. But what the Bible answers is right here at the very last warning. Basically, a thou shalt not. So, basically here we're learning that salvation is of the Lord. And Revelation chapter 22, 19 proves this because it's his to take away or remove or blot out. As it also states in another chapter of Revelation. But as far as lose your salvation, you can't lose it like you lose a set of car keys or something like that. As you said, a bad word or <clears throat> treated somebody wrong or, you know, any of these other carnal things. Um, what can cost you your salvation and cause you to forsake the Lord is false doctrine. It's Revelation 22, 19 is quite clear about it. There, it doesn't apply to just 
you know, a certain group of people at a certain time. It's any man. And you can't work your way to heaven just saying Jesus doesn't get you there, but it sure can, you know, cost you to not be able to go there. Because if you don't love the name of the Lord, then you don't love him either, or his word. Because obviously, they haven't actually read the text. And if they have, they've got a problem. If they can't understand the plain, simple text as it's written, and if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life, and out of the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. What all is written in the book of Revelation of Jesus Christ? It's not of St. John the Divine. And one other thing, um, I'm sorry I have to be like this about it, but um, if you claim to believe that the King James Bible is the word of God, and you say that hallelujah word, you are blaspheming the word of God. I'm going to warn you right now because you are repeating words that was removed and added to the Bible. Check out Revelation chapter 19. We will find a word that is spelled capital A-L-L-E-L-U-I-A. -L 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 -E hallelujah. We never find hallelujah. That is in the NIV, the ESV, and all them other filthy books. That is, that's, that's not actually what the English Bible says. That's what the West Cotton Hort, you know, Alexandrian text says. You are calling that person a false teacher and a heretic and someone who teaches things contrary to the Word of God. Anytime you have a man-made system and you must fit the Bible into it, it's never going to work. It's never going to work. Just trust the Bible for what it says. It's pretty plain. Look at Hebrews chapter 6. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 6. And if you don't know where all these at, you can just listen if you want. You don't have to try to look them all up. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 6, it might be easier for you that way. Beginning in verse number 4, it said, it's, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost, and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if thou shalt fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. You see, here's the truth. There's a lot of people who have heard the truth but reject it. In 2 Peter chapter 2, again, the parallel passage to what we have here in June, Jude in verse 18 down to verse number 20, the Bible says, for when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lust of the flesh. Through much wantonness, those who were clean escape from them who live in error. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. For whom a man is overcome of the same as he brought in bondage. For if, after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. He goes on to say, plucked up by the roots. We're just going to say it this way, they will get destroyed. Because that's what happens with dead plants that are pulled up. They're cast into the fire. And it's what God will do to those who rebel against him and do not produce the fruit that he demands. Think about it. And put a knife to thy throat if thou be a man given to appetite. You say, what? Listen, it doesn't mean literally kill yourself, but it says, listen, you have no self-control and you're a gluttonous person, you're doing wrong. Look at Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21. And verse number 34 and 35. The Bible says, and take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness, and cares of this life, and so that day come upon you unawares. For as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. God says you better be careful. Don't be filling up your belly and worried about satisfying your flesh and the things of this earth because there's coming a day when the Lord will return. Don't get caught unprepared. In fact, literally, if you understand the Bible, what the Bible teaches, you'll be caught unclothed. We also saw the need to have a real life. 
not just living as we please because we have hope, but truly living the way we should. He says, and compelled them to blaspheme. I want you to get this. Because Paul, in his answer to Agrippa, makes it clear who he's talking about. Look at verse 10. Actually, let's go back to verse 9. I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus Christ. He says, I'm going to do everything to get rid of that name. Which thing I also did in Jerusalem. And many of the, what? Verse 10. Which thing I also did in Jerusalem. And many of the saints. saints. Paul tells us here that the things he did, he did to Christians. That's important. Because look what he says he was able to get Christians to, what he did to Christians, and compelled them to blaspheme. This word compelled here has the idea of getting people to do as you wish by threat or force. That means you could threaten them or torture them until they denied Jesus or blasphemed. Until they said something against Jesus. Now I want us to get this truth here. Again, we saw who does Paul say it's about? Verse 10, it's about the saints. These were true believers who under pressure, force, and torture blasphemed. We like to think that we're above this. I don't care what they would ever do to me. I would never deny Jesus. We also saw the need to have a real life. Not just living as we please because we have hope, but truly living the way we should. Well, if they tied you down and they were ripping your fingernails out with a pair of pliers one by one, you think you wouldn't get the pain to stop? This know also that in the, latter, in the last days, perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemous, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good. 2 Timothy 3. Traitors, heedy, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof, and such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women, laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. You see what it says there in verse number six? They creep into houses. They've come in by stealth. They're creeps who have creep crept in. If they were surgically removing each finger one at a time with no, do you think you could actually stand that? I mean, some of us can't stand scraping our knee. I mean, some of us hit our thumb with a hammer and start cussing like a sailor. But yet we think that under pressure, ripping our fingernails out, we wouldn't deny Jesus. You already denied him just by hitting your thumb with a hammer. They don't live like the things of God. They don't care about the things of God. They live however they want, but they have a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof. Oh, I love Jesus. Uh, weren't you just out at the bar last night drinking and smoking and sleeping around doing all kinds of... Yeah, but I love Jesus, Right? Paul says he was able to get saints. He compelled them to blaspheme. These were true believers who under pressure, force, or torture, blaspheme. But I want us to remember that, you know what we are? We're just weak flesh people. And blasphemy is just one of the many things that once we get saved, we are supposed to put off. They did all this, hoping... To get relief is really what they were looking for. Do you know why most people who claim the name of Christ today do the little bit of Christianity that they do? Because they hope to get relief. They're hoping to not go to hell. That's all they're really looking for. Well, I'll live and do and act however I want as long as I don't go to hell. And I won't go to hell because I have Jesus in my heart. Hebrews 11 verse 6. But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Listen, don't, don't think you can play this game halfway. Don't, don't think that you can go, well, you know, I can live and do whatever I want. And, and, and sprinkle a little Jesus on top and I'll be okay. Jesus isn't a seasoning to make your life better. Amen. 
He's not just a seasoning to sprinkle on top. He's not a little parsley on top to make it look better. No, he needs to be the very foundation of your life. Listen, it, 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 if you want to put it in terms of a recipe like we just did, listen, he's the main part of the recipe. If it's chicken cacciatore, and I don't even really know what that is, he'd be the chicken, amen? You can't have cacciatore without chicken cacciatore without the chicken. My point is just this, that he must be the very center of your life, not just a little sprinkling on top. In our message, we talked a little bit about how some of us have felt that misguided zeal against us. Especially in light of today. Amen? People who think they're zealous for God telling us, How dare you not celebrate? Well, find me the place in the Bible where it tells me to. Well, well, it tells about his birth. So that means you should celebrate. Okay, so I tell people about his birth, and I believe in his birth, and I preach his birth, and I teach his birth, but where does it tell me to have an annual celebration of his birth? Well, it's what we've always done. What who's always done? Listen, I'll tell you what, in studying some of our forefathers in the faith, do you know what I found? Well, it's what we've always done. What who's always done? But yet, we've had this idea. True believers would never do that. So there's other verses as well about not denying the Lord. Revelation chapter 3 verse 8. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews, but and or not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee, because thou hast kept the word of my patience. I will also, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world, to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Hey, what about this nobody can pluck me out of his hand thing that people try to act like is uh, faithlessness equates to salvation? It doesn't. That's heresy. Um, with all that being said, I don't believe that a person's saved because they say Jesus but uh, yeah, you can you can definitely go to hell for denying the Lord Jesus or the faith, whether directly or not. Um, there's other ways of doing it other than what you saw Peter do it. For instance, the full masons, they'll go in their lodge and swear to be in dar darkness and search a lot. Um, that actually is an open denial of Jesus Christ, and uh, you know that's counting the blood covenant that they were supposed to be sanctified with as not a holy thing. I don't want to call it. Uh, but anyway, it's not enough for them, so they go in there looking for a lot. So they openly deny that they that they believe that Jesus is the way. Um, there's other false religions that'll get you to do that as well. Um, but that's that's a topic for another video. I'm trying not to make this one crazy long. Um, there's definitely going to be a couple more parts to it though. Listen, I'll tell you what. In studying some of our forefathers in the faith do you know what i found that during the middle ages we had many christians who when they were really going through it when they were being tortured by the catholic church they recanted as the catholic church calls it you're right you're right you're right you're right and then they were let go and then they live with that regret in the rest of their life they said i was wrong i shouldn't have recanted but under that force and that pressure they did that mean that person was never saved? No, that means they went through some stuff. Well, I'm going to live and do whatever I want because I asked Jesus in my heart. So I'm going to go to heaven. If we're truly believers, we need to live as imitators of Christ. Paul says he was able to get true believers to blaspheme God. To say, okay, you're right, he's not Messiah. They weren't doing it because they were denying Jesus. They were doing it because they couldn't deal with the pain. 
Let's go to the Bible's definition of what saving grace is in Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2, verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation. The grace of God that does what? Bringeth salvation. This is saving grace. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. You see, they've turned the true biblical grace into a means to live as the flesh desires and wants. They aren't crucified with Christ like Galatians 2.20 tells us. They aren't daily dying to self like 1 Corinthians 15.31 says. There's no taking up your cross and following Christ like Luke 9.23. They aren't denying themselves like Titus 2.11-14 just showed us. Well, I believe that those who are strong in the faith will never blaspheme. Those who are weak just might under pressure and then repent of it in private later. We never know what those who were compelled to blaspheme went through. I mean, think about it. Some of us complain and lose our testimony over the smallest things. And yet we're going to look down at those who have in a moment of weakness denied Christ due to persecution. How many of us deny Christ in the way we live? In the way we speak, in the way we act. How many of us deny Christ in not speaking the truth in love to those who need to hear it? If you're too ashamed or timid to say you are a believer, when it's only an emotional toll it might take on you, how dare we question those who were tortured? Let's see where lasciviousness comes from. Mark chapter 7, verse 20. And he said, That which cometh out of the man that defileth the man. That which cometh out of the man that defileth the man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornication, murders, theft, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these things come from within and defile the man. Comes from out of a man's evil, wicked heart. Think about it, Christian. Have you ever sat around in a place and you're hearing people talk about a subject and you know what the Bible says about it, but you just sit there and... Get them to say. Guess what you just did? You blasphemed. You just did the same thing. You denied your Savior by not opening your mouth and saying something. You see, I'm not going to call those people who, in the midst of being tortured, denied Christ, fake sophonies. If Paul here in the Bible, and Luke records under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that they were saints. For there are certain men, corrupt and unawares, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness, and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though ye once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, Afterward destroyed them that believed not. And the angels, which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved an everlasting change unto darkness, unto the judgment of the great day. You see, later on, Paul tells us what he thinks about what he did to these people. Take your Bibles, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter number 15, verse number 9. <clears throat> Paul says, For I am the least of the apostles that am not meet to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. Paul's talking now, Paul saved now. He didn't say, Why well, persecuted those fakes and found out they were fakes? I think if I was turned to 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter number 1, look at verse number 12. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord 
who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in my belief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful, faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Paul, you're a well-learned Jewish scholar. You know what the Bible says about Messiah, but you're fighting against what you know to be the truth. By the way, let me tell you something, Christians. Many of the people that persecute us for trying to live out this book, they do it against knowing what's right. And the Christians are being asked to earnestly contend for the faith, for the one true faith. The words earnestly contend in the Greek are just one word. It goes on to say that they are trees whose fruit withereth. Now we can see a comparison to that in Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. Let's look at verse number 7. <clears throat> this is talking about the seed that was sown in the four types of soil. It says, And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. And then in verse 22, he also that receives seed among the thorns is he that bear, heareth the word. And the care of this world and the deceitful and the riches choke the word and he becometh unfruitful. I want to understand this because some people have a misconception about that verse there, Matthew. And they go, wait a minute, wait a minute. They, they bore fruit for a while. They appeared to bear fruit. But that fruit never came to fruition. Why didn't you realize those words go together? Fruition? Fruit? <laughs> Amen. It never became ripe. It looked like it was good, but then guess what happened? It died. It withered on the vine, if you will. And that's who these are, trees whose fruit withered. You know what these fake believers are? They look like fruit trees, but they don't have any fruit. In fact, the Bible goes on to say they're twice dead. Twice dead, yeah. Because they're still dead in their trespasses and sin. And they're also going to be twice dead when they, serve, when they suffer eternal death. Now, it's hard for us to wrap our minds how an eternity suffering can be eternal death. But eternal life is eternal life. What's the opposite of eternal life? Eternal death. They're never going to perish in hell, and they're never going to stop existing, but they're going to be eternally in the state of death. In fact, they're devoid of any life. One guy put it this way. First of all, their fruit withereth, and withering fruit is a sign of dead fruit. And when the tree is plucked out of the ground, it dies because there is no nourishment. So being twice dead is both them and their fruit, or message is dead. This is the same with any false teaching. You can see that in Matthew 23, 15. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you can pass sea and land to make one proselyte. And when he is made, you make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. In Matthew, Jesus was chiding the Pharisees that they would travel far and wide to make a convert to a religion. And since the Pharisees were teaching a false religion, they were making converts from one false religion to another. Why? We got a problem. It's right here. You know what it's called? Flesh. By the way, just pinch it. You'll see it hurts. Pinch it hard enough, you might go, ow! Right? James chapter 1, verse 14 and 15. But every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin when it's finished bringeth forth death by the way verse 16 says do not err my beloved brethren the word lust in this verse carries with it the meaning of longing and craving when we see them walking after their lust in this verse it means they are pursuing their desires what are the desires and cravings of false teachers it is the power to command maybe i should go talk to them tell them what a real preacher is supposed to be not a man who's married twice because he's going to run around on his wife and fool around with someone else that married somebody else in the church. These false teachers are very jealous about being the boss in the church that their lust binds them to the destruction they are causing. I'm here to tell you, if you're filled with pride, you're a sodomite. Maybe I should go talk to them, tell them what a real preacher is supposed to be. That was the first sin of Sodom in the morning. In fact, when they list those sins, the last one listed is that they went after strange flesh or, or homosexuality. They don't care who they wreck or who they destroy, but they will do what they can to gain power and notoriety. There are Christians that I personally know 
who will not go to church simply because they can't be under anyone's authority. They have to be the boss. The word walking carries with it the meaning of order in one's life. These false teachers and perfectionists order their life according to their own desires to rule. They fail to realize that being in a position of leadership and being responsible for others is a very serious task. Their concern is not for those they rule, but their concern is that they be the ones ruling. Well, what a great quote. Do you know any of them people that can't go to any church because I won't be under any man's authority? <coughs> I do. It's funny he would bring that up considering that he doesn't even attend a real church. There are no seasoned men. There are no deacons. There are no elders. There's just there's just butch that runs the show church has to have deacons and elders there there's an order that paul set forth you know um i do bible study with my family every night but you know we're not we're not going to church and unfortunately we haven't found anywhere to gather that we can actually do that but i'll be more than happy to submit myself to a local church as soon as i find one that's actually fled idolatry uh, here in my land, uh, it's usually Masons, Jesuits, Knights of Columbus that run the so-called church building. So I uh, wasn't able to find one that I could stay in. Uh, typically, they all got that stupid American flag of glory up there that they worship. So it's first warning sign not to go in those places. Um, but yeah, there's, there's an order for a New Testament church. And uh, Butch by himself doesn't fulfill the role of, of deacon, bishop, and elders. Um, so, yeah, he, he definitely fits the definition of somebody that doesn't like uh, to do anything but give the orders and be the boss of the show. He shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Verse 24, And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. See, Christians, real Christians, don't act that way. The Bible says, and their mouth speak great swelling words. They murmur, complain, walk after their own lust, and their mouth speak great swelling words. They're looking for applause. They're looking for self-applause and vain glory. Because if we live what we believe and believe that they're saints, and we know people can smack their thumb and deny Christ with their words just because of the pain from that, we really don't think... Under persecution, a Christian could say, no, 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 you're right, because they want the pain to stop. The truth of the gospel has been so perverted by these creeps that the true gospel is almost not even known today. In fact, most people who preach and teach what they call the gospel don't even understand the gospel. People like Stephen Anderson. You see, we've always been taught, especially amongst fundamentalism, and people who take this book serious, if they ever denied Christ, they were never truly saved. But Paul says they were saints. So let me ask you a question. Do you believe that saints stay saints? Or do you believe they can lose their salvation? And bring upon themselves with destruction. Peter also gave us one. And I want you to see something about that word there. Before of old or Revelation chapter 21 and verse number 8. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. They are reserved. To whom is reserved a dark blackness of darkness forever. Let's go ahead and look at verse number 14. It says, And Enoch also the seventh from Adam. You see, Jude has told us all about these people. If you go back and just quickly look, he said in verse number five, he says, Look, I want to remind you of things, that you, something you used to know, but they had forgotten. He says, i got to remind you of these things. He says, I want to remind you, and he does this because of the fact that there were false teachers, and they need to contend for the faith which was once delivered, to earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. He says, I want to remind you what happens to those people who are disobedient to God. The children of Israel, after he brought them out of Egypt, he brought them through the sea on dry land. 
He did all these miracles for them. They sent out some spies. They saw a little bit of giants in the land, and they, we can't go do it. God's not big enough to help us anymore. I mean, literally, that's what they did. They stopped believing. And because of that, they were punished. They weren't allowed to see the promised land. He tells us that the angels that left their first estate. I told you what I think that believes, but they were reserved in everlasting chains in the darkness unto the judgment of the great day. There's coming at that time when they who are now chained in hell will be cast into the lake of fire for all eternity. He also told us of Sodom and Gomorrah and how God destroyed them, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. And why did God do it to them? Because they went after their own fleshly desires. I'm here to tell you, if you're filled with pride, you're a sodomite. That was the first sin of Sodom and Gomorrah. In fact, when they list those sins, the last one listed is that they went after strange flesh or, or homosexuality. You say, well, why would you say that, brother? Let's take your Bibles, turn back to Psalm. The very first Psalm. What does the passage here tell us? These men are what kind of men? Ungodly men. Look at Psalm 1 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Listen, I believe if you know that that person is one of these men who have prepped and unaware, and you make an excuse, well, there's no other good church, so I gotta go here. Don't expect to be blessed. Because blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of ungodly. You are willingly walking in the counsel of ungodly men. By the way, that uh, kind of destroys that whole uh, chew the meat, spit out the bones thing, doesn't it? Well, I, I, I can read that book because I can chew the meat and spit out the bones. Uh, you're supposed to walk not in the counsel of ungodly. Ooh, that might hurt some of them, what you hear all the time, but it's not what the word of God says. You know what? If I get enough followers, it's an advantage. Amen. Hey, listen, I thank God for every person who wants to watch, but don't follow me, follow Christ. You can follow me as I follow Christ. But if I'm not following Christ, then don't follow me. Get out from away from me. Leave me alone. In fact, tell me. I pray God gives me a good swift kick in the backside. Give me straight, amen. You see, we've reminded of things we once knew. Judas reminded us that these men who have crept in unawares won't get away with their sin. They'll be punished as Israel, the angels, and the Gomorrah have all and will be punished. Jude told us of their brass speaking against things they knew not of. Jude gave a warning to them and denounced them with his woe unto them. He told us what they resembled in verse 12 through 13, some of those things there. Wandering stars, waves of the sea, clouds without water. We now know what false teachers look like and how they act. But we also know that we need to not fear because they will be punished. Let me say this. Let's not be like the people that Jude wrote to. Let's remember these things. Let's not forget to remember them. Let's not have to have someone say, I want to remind you of the thing you once knew. Let us remember that the evidence, what the evidences of these false teachers are. And when we see those evidences in people, let's get away from them. Plain and simple. If you see the evidence of what a false teacher is like in that person, just get away from them. It's the simplest way to go. Stroke the fires of your passion for the Lord and passion for the lost. You can find it right here in this King James Bible. Amen. I'm not saying there's another good books to read, but if those other books contain heresies, just burn them. By the way, kids like to burn stuff. Take all them old wicked books, go outside, I'd have a bonfire, and let the kids throw them in. Boy, they'll enjoy it. They'll teach them something. By the way, do you know what the people at Ephesus did when they got saved? They burnt all their curious works. Let's go to the Bible's definition of what saving grace is in Titus chapter 2. 
Titus chapter 2, verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation. The grace of God that does what? Bringeth salvation. This is saving grace. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. You see, they've turned the true biblical grace into a means to live as the flesh desires and wants. They aren't crucified with Christ like Galatians 2.20 tells us. They aren't daily dying to self like 1 Corinthians 15.31 says. There's no taking up your cross and following Christ like Luke 9.23. They aren't denying themselves like Titus 2.11-14 just showed us. Because the real Bible grace that brings salvation is devoid of lasciviousness. You're not going to find true biblical grace having the desire to want to feed the flesh. They've turned the grace of God into lasciviousness. It says, and deny the only Lord God. I pray that you get this. In reality, these, these men who have crept in deny the only Lord God. And by the way, he is the only Lord God. There is no other God. Well, hey, if uh, you watch this whole video, I appreciate your time. Um, thank you so much. Um, check out sharingthetruthandlove.com. I've got lots of articles there. You can also read the Bible there as well if you don't have one handy. Uh, it's only the King James. Um, I'm going to probably produce another one or two on Mr. Crawford here uh, later on. Um, probably be february march before the next one comes out um i've got some that i'm working on on danny castle and andy patterson and uh, another man named pete peters probably a lot of y'all don't know about but um anyway yeah i'm, I'm going to get on that this year we're going to do a lot of heretic hunter videos um if you like videos about staying strong in the faith, then uh, you should like this channel because uh, that's all I preach is contending for the faith. Um, this one was really heartbreaking for me and my family. Uh, we all came to love Lawrence and his family just by uh, watching and listening to him on YouTube. And uh, it was heartbreaking. My wife came, woke me up, and uh, told me what she had heard that man say and uh, started asking me questions about defining blasphemy. and. Uh, yeah. Um, but please especially pray for his family and anybody that listens to him that they uh, repent of his false teaching and not hear him on this matter. It's not biblical at all. It's just going to lead people to hell. Um, once saved, always saved doesn't cover this stuff of denying the Lord and being in unbelief and uh, shaming the Lord in public and all that kind of stuff, basically. Um, it, it just doesn't. Salvation is promised to overcomers who contend for the faith and continue to believe all the way up until death, and whether it's persecution or famine or prison or illness, whatever it is, you know, uh, we'll stay faithful in the Lord. And uh, the other one last thing before I close here, he's just trying to drive a bunch of fear into everybody for the, about the world. We're only supposed to fear God, not not what man can do to us. So don't be don't be fearing the end times stuff as far as what the world's concerned. Be be more afraid of God. Make sure your worship's true and pure unto Him alone. And uh, the only way you're really going to make sure to flee from false doctrine is to read your King James Bible and not just read it, but study it, study it, study it, study it. Uh, there's the comment section below. I love y'all and uh, hope y'all are having a good upcoming New Year's. Uh, right now as I'm recording it, it is December 31st at 1.22 p.m. Eastern Time. Um, I've actually got the video edited and ready to go. 
I'm just going to shove this last closing part in here and get it processed and posted. And this will be the last video for me for 2022. I love y'all. And as always, praise the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. May richly bless you and yours. Hope to see you in 2023, Lord willing. Love.